Hello and welcome to the last edition of Diversity in 2012. So today we'll talk about several things. Don't miss our preview. Storyline. The Film Fest Düsseldorf. Webcheck. Fmylife and Vice.com. Open Topic. An interview with the Nepalese journalist Rabindra Mishra. Speak Out. How do you celebrate Christmas? Music Corner. The band You Say France and I Whistle with their song OMG. To start, uh, for Storyline, in this occasion we'll talk to you about uh, Film Fest Düsseldorf, which took place in November and it has reached a very good status worldwide. Let's have a look. It's the smell of popcorn in the air and the atmosphere of cinema when it's time for the film festival of the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf. This November, the students and many other fans of short movies celebrated the 10th anniversary of this film event. It's a non-profit festival which is organized by the students of Düsseldorf. It focuses on short films and gives young film directors an opportunity to present their movie to a large audience. Jens Schmidt, a member of the Film Fest team, tells us who is part of the panel of judges. It's first of all important that for us it is a bunte Zusammenstellung ist, that we have people who have natürlich die selbst Filme machen. Zum Beispiel dieses Jahr da Linden, der letztes Jahr den Jurypreis gewonnen hat. Das heißt, wir wollen wirklich Leute, die selbst aus der Materie kommen. Studentische Vertreter ist uns wichtig hier von Derin dieses Jahr, damit wir ein studentisches Filmfest sind und die studentische Sicht auch irgendwie darstellen wollen. Ja, ansonsten wirklich Leute, die im Filmbusiness grob sind, aber von verschiedenen äh, Positionen das sehen. Also einmal Produzent, Regisseur, wir versuchen wir möglichst eine bunte Mischung zu machen. The festival mainly takes place in the university. The movies with the most votes will be in the grand finale, which takes place in the Film Museum in Düsseldorf. Ja, mein Name ist Bernd Diesinger, ich bin der Direktor des Filmmuseums Düsseldorf. Und wir sind in diesem Jahr zum dritten Mal Gastgeber und Partner des Filmfest Düsseldorf. Wir sind sehr gerne Gastgeber. Auf der einen Seite führen wir Leute ins Haus, auch Studenten, die aus anderen Städten kommen und unser Haus noch nicht so gut kennen. Die lernen es dadurch kennen, wissen, was für tolle Geschichten es hier gibt. Und für uns selber ist es auch inhaltlich sehr interessant, weil das Filmfest sich auf Kurzfilme konzentriert. Und wir als Filmprofis messen dem Kurzfilm auch eine wichtige Rolle bei. Es ist nicht einfach nur ein kurzer Film, der nur ein paar Minuten lang geworden ist, sondern es ist ja eine Kunstform in sich selbst. Filmfest Düsseldorf is not only for German film directors, but also for international filmmakers who get the opportunity to present their work. Wir bekommen aus ganz vielen Teilen der Welt, bis aus den USA, aus Asien, von überall her, gibt es Einsendungen und dadurch kriegen wir ein sehr großes internationales Programm. Und das passt sehr gut zu diesem Filmfest, das passt sehr gut zur Universität und es passt auch sehr gut zum Filmmuseum. There is also the possibility to get in contact with filmmakers, such as Cedric Retzmann, who came all the way from Berlin to take part in the Filmfest in Düsseldorf. Hi, uh, ich bin Cedric. Ich um, komme aus Berlin, war jetzt die letzten Tage mit meinem Regisseur Sascha Quade da und uh, der musste leider gestern abreisen und wir haben den Film Meyer gemacht, der hier im Wettbewerb läuft. Wir wollten mal schauen, wie unser Film so ankommt. Wir wollten einfach ein bisschen Feedback bekommen, ein bisschen gucken, was die Leute in verschiedenen Teilen des Landes, aber auch international so dazu sagen. Weil als wir den Film rausgebracht haben, der ziemlich gutes Feedback bekommen hat in Berlin. Aber wir natürlich sehen wollten, was denkt der Rest davon und auch einfach sehen wollten, können wir was gewinnen, können wir Erfolg damit haben. The movie Maya won the Audience Award for Best Short Film. But the film festival is not only about winning prizes. Everyone who is attending this movie event has the chance to get in contact with other filmmakers. So ein Festival, da kann man nicht nur unbedingt was gewinnen, sondern man, man trifft viele Leute. Also es sind viele Leute da, die einem auch eventuell weiterhelfen können. Wo es Sinn macht, diesen Leuten die Arbeit, die eigene Arbeit mal zu zeigen, um dann auch ein Feedback von denen zu bekommen, mit denen ins Gespräch zu kommen. Ja, einfach so ein bisschen die Kontakte zu erweitern. Ich wusste gar nicht, was für ein Festival das ist. Ich bin einfach mitgefahren und habe dann erfahren, dass es ein von Studenten organisiertes Festival ist. Ähm, aber dafür wirkt es sehr groß und sehr, sehr gut organisiert. Also ich bin absolut zufrieden. Wir haben Unterkunft bekommen und alles. Man kümmert sich sehr gut um uns. Ähm, und es sind 
sehr gute Filme gelaufen, wie ich fand. Und ja, ich fand es ein ganz, ganz tolles Festival, auf jeden Fall. The team of the film festival as well as the audience enjoyed a well-organized and entertaining event. Ja, mir hat es sehr gut gefallen, weil es viele verschiedene Filme gab, also kurze, lange, animierte und nicht animierte, mit jungen Schauspielern, mit alten Schauspielern und ja, ich fand es sehr vielfältig und freue mich schon aufs nächste. Das Bier ist günstig und die Filme sind auch nicht schlecht. Ich fand es ganz gut, es war mein erstes Jahr und bis jetzt fand ich es ganz gut. Genau, ich war im letzten Jahr schon da. Ich finde es echt cool, dass die Studenten das organisieren und ich finde, es hat alles gut geklappt. Hat mir super gefallen. Das war jetzt mein erstes Filmfest, aber ich werde auf jeden Fall wiederkommen, weil ich fand, es waren echt crazy Sachen dabei, aber auch ästhetisch total schöne Filme. Also von daher hat es sich gelohnt. Ich muss sagen, das Resümee hast erstmal, es wird weitergehen. Das zehnte Jahr war jetzt ein ganz großartiges Jubiläumsjahr. Es gab einige wirklich wunderbare und beeindruckende Filme. Und ich glaube, dass sich das Profil über die Jahre immer weiter gestärkt hat und gehe davon aus, dass wir im nächsten Jahr wenigstens ebenso viele, ebenso gute Beiträge aus aller Welt zugesandt bekommen werden und wieder mit einem ganz spannenden Programm aufwarten werden. Und natürlich ist das Filmmuseum liebend gerne wieder Partner, wenn es heißt elftes Filmfest Düsseldorf der Heinrich-Hahn-Universität. After three days of creative and professional short films, entertainment program and film atmosphere, we are looking forward to the next Film Fest 2003 in Düsseldorf. And now for a web check, we have two different websites. One of them is fmylife.com, which contains different and funny stories you may like, and bias.com, which is about the independent and cultural magazine. Check them out. The best web we have is fmylight.com. It's a blog that serves as a recollection of everyday anecdotes likely to happen to anyone. Posts on the site are short, user-submitted stories of an unfortunate happenings that always begin with today and end with FML. You can navigate through the stories in the different categories or choose to moderate them and decide if the story is good or bad. You can also submit your own FML and you can have your own account and read the stories as well. If you are not an English speaker, you can check the different versions they have in different languages. The other web we have is Vice.com, which is the web version of the magazine originally launched in the late 90s in Canada. Today is internationally known being available in almost 30 countries and its web contents are all about independent and cultural topics like art, music and fashion. Also, it's known to its controversy and also the relationship through advertising with fashion brands and different personalities into the world of art and music. There you can see different articles and sections. One of the most known and funny of them is Do's and Don'ts. For open topic, we'll have an interview with the chief editor of BBC Nepal, Javin Ramisha. He'll talk about his project, Help Nepal Network. Welcome everybody to the show. We've got a special guest here today, Mr. Rabrindra Mishra. Uh, he's a Nepali journalist um, and the chief editor of BBC Nepali Radio Network and the founder of um, the Help Nepal Network. Welcome to the show, first of all. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. It's my privilege to be here in the television and talk to you. <laughs> Mr. Mishra, you are currently traveling through Europe trying to raise funds for your Help Nepal network. Can you tell us something about uh, the goals of your network? Uh, Help Nepal network, one euro a month fund for Nepal. Uh, this is a charity which was established about 12 years ago. And the, uh, the whole idea of the charity was to encourage Nepali people living abroad and living inside Nepal to do more for Nepal. Because the idea was, in most of the third world countries like Nepal, what happens is, you know, somebody starts a non-governmental organization and the 
people uh, working there or the people who establish, they start seeking funds from international donors. And, uh, you know, they write proposals, they get the donations, and then, you know, they uh, take salary from the same money, and then they run the office from the same money, and then they do some work as well. So most of the time, we rely on international donors, international donations. But what we thought was, first, Nepali should have the, uh, the feeling uh, you know, the, in a way, the patri patriotic feeling uh, and should think that we, sh we are responsible first, we need to do first for Nepal, and then if we can't, then obviously, you know, we can seek uh, support from uh, foreigners as well. So what we said was we want to collect money from Nepalis and we want to encourage Nepalis to do something for Nepal from wherever they come, you know, from cities, from villages. And we created a slogan, one euro a month fund for Nepal. In America, it becomes one dollar a month fund for Nepal. The idea was, if you don't have a lot, then give little. If you have more, give slightly more. But you give first before you ask from others. So that is the way we thought, and that is how the charity was established. Because most of the time, you know, uh, Nepalis and many of the third world country people, you, you'll see them talking about the country very passionately. They criticize the politicians for not doing things correctly. They criticize the bureaucrats for not doing things correctly. And then if you ask them, OK, you are also a Nepali, or you are also a Bangladeshi, you are so passionate about your country's, uh, you know, development, and you think you should, your country should do better. Then, as a citizen, what have you do, done to rectify the wrongs that you are so passionately criticizing? If you ask them, then most of them would have no answers because we seek rights, and then we don't want to be responsible. So the idea of Help Nepal Network was to make Nepalis more responsible towards their country. That was on a philosophical level. Yeah. On the ground level, we said, OK, then we collect money. And what we do, we work in the areas of health and education and disaster relief. So uh, in the beginning, it was very difficult. But then slowly we gain credibility because, you know, initially we put in our own money to do a few works. And then right from the beginning, we separated the charitable fund and the administrative fund. And that is very, very unusual for most of the charities in the world. You know, any big charities you name, they, uh, you know, raise funds. And from that fund, certain per percentage goes towards uh, running the office. But we said, you know, if we start doing that, then it becomes a profession. We don't want to make charity a profession uh, because we want to make it, uh, make it a service, you know, as such. Like, we actually want to transcend our professional boundary and to do things for the society. So right from the beginning, we separated the two. And then whatever people donated, to you know, build a school or a health post or a library, all the money went towards the project, and all the administrative expenses, we initially we put our own money and run the administration. Later on, we collected funds from uh, 25 Nepalis, and that fund is around um, 175,000 euros or 200. 30,000 US dollars, and uh, it is put in a high interest account in Nepal. So the interest generated from that fund goes towards running the office. And there were generous Nepalis who donated to that fund. And all other money that we raise for charity directly goes to projects that we do. And we have built around 40 schools, smaller schools so far. We have built around 40 libraries. And then we, we are constructing a huge orphanage uh, in the outer skirts of the capital, Kathmandu. And within a year, that will come into operation. And we'll be housing 40 orphans in that uh, in that place, and then we run health posts as well, and we support you know people affected by floods, affected by fire, people suffering from hunger, and then we do all these kind of things, and there are more and more Nepali people who are supporting us. 
But this support mainly goes to the rural areas or cities as well? No, most of the time it goes to rural areas. Sometimes, you know, we do work in city schools as well, but not the private schools, but the government-run schools, which are in a very, very, um, you know, very, very bad condition. You just said that many Nepalis share a passion for their country and um, criticize politics, government, this, the state of the country, but don't do anything to help. Is that an experience you shared personal, personally? Uh, I think, you know, the, it is not only me, lots of Nepalis and lots of people from the third world countries sh share the similar experiences uh, because we are uh, politically very vocal. You know, we can demonstrate on the streets every day, uh, come out on the streets every day. We can throw stones, we can break glasses, and we can do all these things. But when we, actually it comes to contributing towards a society, we think that is the responsibility of the government. That is true. But if the citizens aren't responsible, how can government be responsible? Because government is an institution which is made up of citizens, right? And uh, what we also think is, in a country like Nepal, for example, in Germany, the system works. So a citizen, if he fulfills his professional duties sincerely, that will be enough, because the system functions. In a country like Nepal, where the system doesn't function properly, citizens have to be more responsible. When the state becomes weak, it is the duty of the citizen to be more responsible. Otherwise, the country will be completely anarchic. It will just fall apart. So you can't blame the government when the, you know that it is very weak. You can try to improve it, but you can't just sit quietly and do nothing and say that it is the responsibility of the government when you actually know that government actually can't even function. So what we say is, Yes, you know, government isn't doing things correctly. Bureaucrats aren't doing things correctly. But we always say they have to do it correctly, and citizens themselves rarely do it. So our point is, OK, things are bad. So transcend your professional boundary. Come out of your professional boundary. First thing, you do your, fulfill your responsible, uh, responsibilities properly and sincerely in your profession. Then, apart from that, come out of that boundary and try to do something for the society. So you create a positive atmosphere, positive vibe. So you create responsible citizens. And after 10 years, these are the people who will go into government, who will go into bureaucracy, who will go into judiciary, and they will be more responsible. Otherwise, you criticize the government, you come home, and you be corrupt. You don't be responsible. Nepal is, you know, one of the most corrupt countries in the world, uh, according to Transparency International reports. You know, out of maybe 180, 84 countries that they surveyed last year, Nepal was in 154 number. So as people, we might be nice, but we are corrupt as well. And the, the effort at a philosophical level, you know, of this charity is to raise us from that level and make us more responsible towards the society. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mishra, I thank you for this interview. I wish you the best of luck with uh, raising more funds throughout Europe. You're traveling to Portugal tomorrow. Um, wish you the best of luck with your organization. And um, thanks for coming. And, and thank you so much for your, for your television station and to yourself for inviting me and allowing me to share this very personal opinion about you know charity and journalism and various other things. Thank oh, you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. The other day we went to the Christmas market and asked the people of Münster how are they going to celebrate Christmas this year. Natürlich mit äh, meiner Familie, meinen Eltern und äh, ja, wir gehen erst äh, Skifahren, dann äh, in die Kirche und äh, dann gibt es hoffentlich ein paar Geschenke und äh, anschließend wird lecker Raclette gegessen. Ganz traditionell feiern wir Weihnachten mit unseren Kindern, mit, den Groß äh, mit der Großmutter 
und mit den Tanten zusammen. Es ist ja, es ist ja auf der einen, auf die eine Art und Weise ist es natürlich auch ganz nett und gemütlich und heimlich und schön, aber mehr auch nicht. Also es hat keine wirkliche Bedeutung für mich. Also natürlich, äh, da ich auch einen Sohn habe, sind wir schon mit der Familie zusammen, aber das an sich äh, ist vollkommen uninteressant. Ich feiere dieses Jahr Weihnachten äh, auf der Arbeit. Wo arbeitest du denn? In der Kinder- und Jugendhilfe. Das heißt, ich habe äh, dieses Jahr hatte ich am Nachtdienst und fange um 12 Uhr an und mache bis nächsten Tag 12 Uhr. Aber du musst trotzdem Geschenke kaufen für Freunde, Familie. Ja, und äh, für acht Kinder, die ich dann betreue. Ganz ruhig, ganz besinnlich mit der Familie zu Hause. Und gibt es auch Geschenke? Ja, aber nur ganz kleine, weil wir uns nämlich dieses Jahr entschlossen haben, auch ein bisschen zu spenden. Ich fahre nach Hause zu meiner Familie, ich komme eigentlich aus Stuttgart. Ja, und dann fahre ich nach Hause, kurz vor Weihnachten und verbringe dann da. Schon äh, Geschenke besorgt? Nee, noch nicht leider, ich hatte noch keine Zeit. So, what are you going to do this Christmas? I'm going to go home. Where is home? Home is Liverpool in England. Do you have any presents yet? No, I don't, well, I don't know. I mean, presents are surprises. They're supposed to be surprises, so I don't, I don't know. Are you looking forward to Christmas or are you... Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited for Christmas. Oh, you like Christmas? I love Christmas. You love Christmas? I love Christmas. Do you love Christmas? Absolutely. <laughs> nice. Do you have any presents? No. Uh, no, I haven't bought any yet. I bought one for her. Yay! You want to tell us what, what it is? I know what it is. Socks. <laughs> so, uh, dann erzählen Sie mal, wie feiern Sie dieses Jahr Weihnachten? Ich feiere Weihnachten, indem meine Kinder, die schon alle erwachsen sind, aus allen möglichen Städten nach Hause kommen, zu mir. Und dann feiern wir gemeinsam und meine Enkelkinder auch dabei und da freue ich mich schon riesig drauf. Das klingt schon mal ganz nett. Haben Sie denn auch schon alle Geschenke zusammen oder muss das noch gemacht werden? Ich habe fast alles zusammen, weil ich ja hier auf dem Weihnachtsmarkt arbeite, habe ich natürlich schon vorgesorgt, habe auch schon gebastelt, also fast habe ich alles zusammen. Ganz traditionell mit Weihnachtsbaum, leckerem Essen. Und auch mit der Familie? Nein, ohne Familie. Und äh, dann müssen Sie auch wohl keine Geschenke besorgen. Ist das äh, was Gutes oder was Schlechtes? Es geht so. Natürlich traditionell ein Geschirr mit riesiger Familie, aber ein paar Geschenke müssen leider doch gekauft werden. Da kommt man leider nicht immer rum. Die werden dann an den Weihnachtsfeiertagen dann doch verteilt. This Christmas we go to Spain and spend the Christmas with the family. Where in Spain? Cordoba. Ah, nice. This Christmas I will stay here in Münster or maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll go to Italy. I will spend the Christmas in Rome. Yeah, because I don't know, I couldn't fly back home because it's difficult, so I thought Italy would be nice. Ich werde dieses Jahr Weihnachten in Istanbul sein bei Freunden. Oh, wie cool, wie kommt das? Äh, es kommt daher, dass sie gerade da ein Erasmus-Jahr äh, machen und dass ich gedacht habe, warum nicht? Also ich habe dieses Jahr noch keinen Urlaub gehabt und ähm, ja, wollte halt gerne mal weg. And to say goodbye, we have a band called uh, Juicy Friends and I Whistle. Hope you like it and see you next year in the new edition of Diversity. Merry Christmas to everyone.